So the uh, next and final uh, panel is on uh, recovery. And we have assembled here a wonderful group of people who can speak to that issue. But first is the wonderfully named Dr. James James. And I, and I have to ask, to satisfy my own curiosity, is the middle initial J also a James? No. No, it is not. And you got it backwards. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's. January. Is January. <laughs> Dr. James, January James. Wonderful. And he's with the American Medical Association and, as you can see, the director of their Center for Public Health Preparedness and Disaster Response. Uh, next is uh, Joe Calabrese. He's from Butler Shine. He's a territory manager for the area. He's been spending a lot of time talking with our veterinary customers and he has some uh, very soul-searching stories to share about the challenges our veterinary customers have been experiencing. Next are uh, two gentlemen from uh, Gulfport, Mississippi, brothers Dr. Mike and Dr. Tim McCabe. They have lived this. They have been through uh, the difficulty of recovering from a storm and they have uh, seen things that all of us are now uh, coming to terms with and they will tell their personal story about how they rebuilt their practices. It really is a pleasure to be here. Uh, you're all very, very fortunate in one way and very unfortunate in another way. Uh, I only learned about um, this get-together a day and a half ago, so I didn't have time to put together my 60-slide presentation for you all and keep you here for the rest of the day. Uh, but outside of using uh, PowerPoint usually for a crutch, I also use it to keep myself on track. And if I don't keep myself on track, I could really talk about the topics I'm going to be talking about for about the next hour, two, or three. Um, so I went ahead and made some notes. And rather than try and give a prepared presentation, I'd like to run down a few observations from the work I've done, uh, actually now for almost 40 years uh, in this area, both in the military at Miami-Dade County Health Department during uh, anthrax uh, and with the AMA uh, for the past 10 years. It's always nice to be called an expert in this area, and we're all experts in this area, but we're like lawyers. You can all ask us a question, you'll get five different opinions. I mean, unfortunately, there's not a lot of fact in this area. I know the purpose of today's symposium is to provide you with information to help you move on, to help rebuild and move on. My focus is somewhat different. My focus is not so much to help you move on from this one, uh, but hopefully uh, to give some information that might help you prepare better for the next one. Uh, the work I've done at the AMA is basically education and training of healthcare uh, providers uh, even though it's the AMA, we are not limited to doctors. Uh, we have doctors, nurses, public health, veterinarians, dental, all of the different disciplines that are represented here today. And we often think of our work as kind of an intersection uh, between medicine and public health. So to keep myself on track, first I'm just going to make some uh, observations that were drawn uh, throughout the day from the presentations that were made this morning, and then I'll uh, finish off with a few com concluding uh, observations. Number one, we've heard about uh, NIMS, the National uh, Incident Management System. Uh, it's a fine system, but you, if you all don't realize, that was derived from responding to forest fires by the Forest Service uh, years ago. And it's been bent and uh, manipulated into a structure for medical response. Now, what's the difference between fire and medical response? Well, fires are pretty constant. You got flames and smoke and uh, things like that. Uh, when you're doing a medical response, you're really dealing with the unknown. And the first thing I, I would like, and the one thing to bring away from this. When people come to you and, you know, are you prepared? Did you have your personal kit prepared? And uh, all of these things. When they ask me that, I ask them, what are you asking me to prepare for? You all can't predict the future any better than I can. 
Does that mean we shouldn't plan, we shouldn't prepare? Of course not. Those are very important things, but don't think just because you plan, you're gonna be ready. That's only one component of it. After evacuation, uh, people do wanna come back home. We need to be very careful about keeping them away too long. They did that in New Orleans very effectively. Their medical establishment is fi still 50% of what it was prior uh, to Katrina. A plan is a great thing, but it's not the plan that's important, it's the exercise and the practice of the plan. When you look and see the success stories, such as Joplin and many of the success stories that came out of here, they came from groups that did have a plan, but they also exercised the plan. That hospital in Joplin actually had uh, conducted an exercise uh, a week before. Somebody this morning said policy is easy. Well, policy may be easy, but sound policy is not. Effective policies are very difficult, and the reason for that is they're usually informed by political concerns, not science and public health concerns. Volunteers are wonderful. What about spontaneous volunteers? There are two types of volunteers. An organized response, where it might be a medical reserve corps, Red Cross, whatever it happens to be, and then you have the spontaneous uh, vol volunteer. They are well-meaning, but more often than not, are more a burden than a benefit. Uh, one of the prime examples uh, we had uh, in um, the New Orleans area in Katrina was a 70-year-old neurosurgeon showing up unannounced uh, ready to do neurosurgery. There weren't a lot of neurosurgical requirements nor facilities available. Uh, he wasn't ready to work in a field environment. He needed a bed to sleep in, he needed food, etc. So he became more uh, part of the relief uh, problem than he did in terms of providing uh, relief. All of you, I shouldn't say that quite like that, but most of you in the audience are providers. You're all citizens first. When you are caught up in something like you just went through, you have a schizophrenic role. First, you're a citizen, and you have your obligations. Somebody else said before, what's the most important thing? Stay safe, darn straight, take care of yourself. You're the most important part. Why? Because if you don't take care of yourself, you're not gonna take care of the next echelon, your family, and then the next echelon above that, your community. When you're a provider, you have an added responsibility. You can be part of the restitution, the ongoing care in the community. You might not be an active responder to going out uh, with disaster, I'm sorry, event victims, but you are a necessary part of the continuity fabric in that community. Once that's secure, then I'm one of those people that believe you do have an absolute obligation uh, to go out and be part of the rescue effort in your uh, community. Uh, we heard some uh, uh, remarks in terms of interest level, and this gets to do with personal preparedness. Right after an event like you just went through, you're gonna be very interested in personal preparedness. Even after Katrina, five years later, you went down there, the people of New Orleans, a weren't any more prepared than any other group is before a major event. Interest goes like this. That is compounded by the fact that disasters are going like that. They're increasing in, fre in frequency and they're also increasing in severity 
because world populations are exploding. Arable land is decreasing, climate war, the whole thing. And we are going to be seeing more and more major events affecting more and more people. Now I want to kind of turn into some of the philosophical or educational things we like to get at. And the first thing is poor leadership is a public health risk factor. If you don't have good, effective leaders, you are not going to have a good response. And the reason is the most important thing is decision making. At least here with Sandy, even in the hospitals that made the decision not to evacuate, that was an informed decision they made. It was a decision informed by all the predictions in terms of surge and wind and everything else. What most people don't realize is most of the data show that when you evacuate people, you have higher mortalities than when you keep them in place, even when you have the kind of situation that you had at Bellevue and some of the other facilities. Then I like to look at my favorite New York philosopher. Incidentally, I was born in Brooklyn, so I'm allowed to say these things. And, uh, and that's Yogi Berra. I didn't like him back then because I was a Brooklyn Dodger fan. But uh, he's got two beautiful sayings to me that get at the heart and soul of so much of what we're about. It's deja vu all over again. And we relive this time after time. And the future isn't what it used to be. We cannot base our lessons learned, which is an oxymoron, and apply those to future events when we don't even know what those events are going to be or where they're going to happen. So now I want to, and I'm almost, I'm getting towards the end of my list here. Um, what are, how do we fix some of these things? How do we do better? What's the underlying problem? I think the major underlying problem rests with the professions. And what we call it is preparedness and response. If I went to a public health figure, they own it. If I went to a nurse, they own it. If I went to a doctor, they own it. If I went to an emergency manager, they own it. We all own it. And until we realize this is a team sport, not an individual effort, we're not going to get to where we have to get to be. And now to pick a little bit on the vet and the dentist from this morning. I think the work they do is wonderful. We incorporate all of those kinds of materials into our courses and things. But when you're a responder to an event, you cannot only be trained in your particular discipline. If you have a vet respond to an area where there just happens to be no animals, does that mean we can't use him or her? I'd rather have a vet with a scalpel doing something to me than somebody who's never used a scalpel before. We need to look at extending the abilities of people. We've done this very effectively with uh, dental programs. And in Illinois, we've done some nice things with that. So I'm going to finish off with the story of two Henrys. Uh, the first one is Henry Ford, and I think he really summed up the solution to this. Uh, he had three levels of getting things done as an integrated group. Number one, you come together. And this is an example of coming together. And we do that extremely well. Since 9-11, we've gone to the second level. We talk together, also uh, extremely important. We still have not learned how to work together. And until we learn how to do that, uh, I, I think we're going to go into the same repetitive problems. 
AMA, as many of you may or may not know, is getting out of the uh, focus area of preparedness and response. To me, that's not all bad because uh, our, psych our psychologist friend before, uh, before said from adversity, you know, comes a new career. You get fired from one job, you want to start something else. And we, as of January 1st, are going to be starting a society of disaster medicine and public health, which is going to be multidisciplinary and open to all people. Its main things is to integrate and to create a discipline of disaster medicine and public health. Uh, we're supported by uh, Academic Journal, which is published by the AMA. This is transferring uh, over to the new society as of uh, next week. Uh, the things we want to offer is basically having a database of the ready, willing, and able. Not everybody should be part of that database, but it should be a robust database bringing us uh, all together. I'm not going to go into the membership card, which is an extremely important part of it, but I do want to reiterate what the last uh, speaker said, and, and I will finish. I have seen people, when they have to leave in an emergency, trying to carry strong boxes. This is all you need. There isn't a thing you have in media, pictures, uh, documents, health records, that can't be put here. And if you combine that with an individual identity, they don't let you use Social Security anymore, so now we use fingerprints and photos and things like that. You can get into any database out there. And all of this isn't futurism. It's here and being done in a lot of places. So if I want to leave you with one thing you should all do with your personal readiness is have one of these and have everything on it and download it with a trusted friend or a relative, et cetera, so you have copies in case you happen to lose uh, that particular thing. Uh, the very, very last thing, we passed out this uh, to everybody. This was a booklet uh, we prepared here, actually in New York. The meetings were here. Uh, uh, Christine Gebby, who is in uh, public health up at uh, Malman School of Public Health in Columbia, uh, and we did this three years ago and published it. And it's rudimentary, but it's aimed at people like you. What do you do in your practice to get ready? Not just you, an individual, but you, your family, and most, of imp most importantly, you, your workers and coworkers. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. Uh, Doc, I have mine over here. OK. <clears throat> OK, thank you very much. Uh, next is uh, from the Gulf of uh, Mississippi, uh, Dr. Mike McCabe. Doc. Good afternoon. Uh, my heart goes out to you. Seven years ago, I was sitting where y'all are sitting, except we had this meeting in November of 2005, and our storm was August the 29th. At this stage, we were doing what Dr. Axelrod was saying. We were wanting to have a drink at about 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, when I got called to ask to come do this, I was really happy. Uh, I told. John Bocom, that uh, I would come as long as my brother could come and sit up here too. Uh, we went to dental school at LSU. And we both graduated in 1982. We went into practice with my dad, who lost his office in 1969 from Hurricane Camille. And we went back to that same place, and we lost hours. It was just a slab. There was nothing. Uh, we had gone down the night before. My sons were here. and. We picked up those big mid-mark chairs and put them on cinder blocks because we thought maybe if a little water comes in, we didn't want the motors to get damaged. When I went down Monday night, that was Sunday, when we went down Monday night, my building wasn't there. Those chairs weren't there. Um, my dad had gone through Camille, and that was before flood insurance completely wiped him out. He never recovered. When we came into practice in 1982, 13 years later, he was still paying SBA. Um, 
So dad always made us get as much insurance as we could. But I don't know if y'all know about your insurance policy. We had no idea. We had it, we'd brought it home, but we didn't know whether we had flood insurance and we didn't know what we had. Um, th at this meeting in Jackson, Mississippi, we had dentists from Florida come and they told us, watch out for the water versus wind. And we went into my dining room where we had all of our papers and, and all of our insurance forms and we tried to understand what it was. And at about this stage, we felt pretty good. And we had practice interruption and the practice interruption for up, was up to a year. At our building site, we could not go back down there for a year. It was, there was no, there, all the infrastructure was gone. So um, we didn't know what we were gonna do. We started thinking about moving. I had a classmate call and say that we could get credentialed in Colorado. Uh, but I've lived in Gulfport my whole life. I was born there. But we came to this meeting and there were dentists that said, I'm living proof you can, you can do this. We've come back last year, we built a new office. And unfortunately, we built it on the same site. So I, I hope it doesn't come. My son is in practice with me now, and he asked me, he said, Dad, are you sure we want to go down there? I said, well, Matthew, I said, I don't think God will do that to me again. He said, what about me? And I said, yeah, there's a good chance. <laughs> so, um, in fact, my daughter, and I didn't know this, she was a freshman at Ole Miss, University of Mississippi. And she wrote a personal statement, professional judgment request to reevaluate financial aid disability, I mean eligibility. Because when she went to Ole Miss, she, didn't, she wasn't eligible for financial aid. This letter was written soon after the hurricane. Uh, when Hurricane Katrina hit, my father had been self-employed in the private practice of general dentistry for 23 years in Gulfport, Mississippi. He owned a two-story brick building one block from the beach, which housed his business. He also owned a two-story frame house on the adjoining property, which was used as rental income. My father, at age uh, 52, had put two sons through Mississippi State University, had supported one while he was pursuing his Juris Doctorate degree, at the University of Mississippi. His second son was two weeks into LSU Dental School in New Orleans, and his daughter had just begun her freshman year at the University of Mississippi. Hurricane Katrina completely destroyed his office building and the rental house next door. All that remained was a concrete slab surrounded by piles of debris. He lost his 5,000 5, square foot building, dental equipment, dental supplies, computers, patient records, patient lab cases, and furnishings. Without any means to practice dentistry, he was suddenly unemployed, remained unemployed for three months, unable to do work or care for his patients. He began to set up a temporary office by purchasing a five-unit modular building <coughs> from the military, which had previously been used as a dental clinic. I bought that building on the phone, sight unseen. Um, we had to go to Birmingham, about 300 miles away, to buy equipment. And at first we thought we want to get a single wide trailer and Tim can have a treatment room on one side, I can have a treatment room on the other side. And then we realized that we would probably kill ourselves. Um, so anyway, we went to Birmingham and we went to Henry Schein and we met with the different manufacturers and we were worried, we had already purchased these buildings. We didn't know where we were gonna put them because we couldn't put them on our property. I called a periodontist that we refer to a lot and he owned some property not far from my office, about two miles from my office that uh, he had had an office on before he went moved to a new office. And I asked him, I said, Rick, can, can I rent your property? And he said, no. And I said, oh, okay. He said, you can have it. Well. Now, I was kind of humbled by that, and I stayed on that property for five years, and I've never paid a dime, but you're gonna have a lot of people that are gonna come and help you, and things are gonna get better. 
It's, it's not going to get better real quick, but, but things are going to get better. Um, some of the things that we did wrong and we did right, damaged computers, don't throw your computers away because they can still retrieve stuff from them. We, we um, all did backups and we all took them home and I asked my office manager why she was giving me one and she was taking one and she said in case we, one of us didn't make it. Well, and then she gave me the main server and I put it in the trunk of my car. And when I got home, I said, well, that seems like a safe place to put it. But all four of my cars were flooded. But fortunately, I'd set it up on top of my golf clubs, so it was, it was okay. But, um, you know, I was, I was telling Gerard earlier about the, the things that happened. When I woke up the next morning and, and uh, went out and looked at my swimming pool, I had shrimp and crabs and um, I, had a, I had a baby alligator that was plastered against my uh, brick mailbox. It was dead, of course. And I don't live on the water. So it was, uh, I had a lot of home damage, but I'd always said, take my home, don't take my office, because if you take my office, I'm gonna lose my house too. So I know all those things are going through your mind, but it, it is gonna get better. Uh, but you are probably gonna face that water versus wind, and that's a terrible thing. Uh, I think they should, should take that out, and we need some kind of multi-peril insurance. And hopefully, with this happening up here, maybe Congress will listen to it. They wouldn't listen to us, so they wouldn't do it. Uh, so we were dropped, and you can expect to be dropped from your insurance, too. Um, the thing that we did is we set up an office in my house. We had our phone forwarded to, to my house. I kept my office manager, half of my staff. We had, how many girls? Four, 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 14 girls worked for us. I know some of them lost their apartments, and they were, they were gone. Uh, we had a loyal staff, and, and a lot of them came back, but they, uh, they were on unemployment, and they took food stamps, and I felt terrible, but I didn't know what was going to happen. Well, about the end of September, we got a letter from our practice interruption that said that, and they explained to me that we had one year's worth of practice interruption based on last year's gross production. Well, shoot, uh, I didn't want to not practice, though. Uh, my patients, I wanted to go back to practice. We would have been drinking at 8 o'clock in the morning if I hadn't gone back. But um, they said that I had that, but the last thing said that it said, however, if water was the cause, you get nothing. And I mean, when I found that out, I was in shock. And we, we came up here after that. We had already actually moved into our building and Henry Shine provided a, an, an insurance expert who we ended up letting represent us. And the first thing he asked me was, who filed your insurance claim? <coughs> Have y'all all filed your own claims? That's what I told him. And he looked at me and he said, I wasn't smart enough to file an insurance claim like that. They also had Price Waterhouse Cooper, and I don't know, Steve, if y'all are gonna have that uh, available, but they filed our, they refiled our claim, and I mean, it like tripled. And now we got real lucky because a federal judge said that that was an ambiguous clause in the, um, this was about, February, he said, that, and the storm was in, in August, he said he found that, that, and it was on the very last page of the policy, because I asked the insurance guy, I said, who reads an insurance policy? Not a dentist, or not these two. And, um, but the judge threw it out as ambiguous. Two months after that, the insurance company took it to the appellate court, they threw his judgment out. But in that window, we got real lucky. And 
I can remember the Florida dentist saying the same thing, don't give up on that. And, you know, we didn't. And uh, the guy called the same guy who, they would, the adjusters would not even come to the coast. They wouldn't come any further than Hattiesburg, Mississippi, which is about 70 miles uh, north. And I'll never forget, we went into his, into his hotel room and he said, we feel like this was completely water. We have a satellite image with 28 feet of water over your building. I said, well, I've got plywood that's impaled on a tree right across the street, and I've got two patients who claim there was a tornado. And he said, well, it's our opinion that we're not paying you anything. And he did this to me. He said, Dr. McCabe, we're not paying you anything. And I told him, I said, I know why you're coming to, uh, you won't come any further than Hattiesburg because they're shooting adjusters down there, like for saying those kind of things. So anyway, after it was thrown out, he came back himself and he was with Fireman's Fund in Philadelphia. He went one of these paid for adjusters and he came on his own, called me up and said, we now think there was a wind component. But this was right after they had thrown that thing out. So we settled. We still didn't get as much, but we got a whole lot more than this. Um, huh? Uh, six. We're right at that, um, and that was from that was from zero. Um, some of the other th other things, and I know y'all have probably done this, but I we wrote my office manager and Tim and I wrote it, so I'm just going to kind of <laughs> go over. Uh, notify the post office of forwarding address. Some insurance companies will not let the post office forward mail, so check for outstanding insurance claims, and some insurance companies will only reissue a check at your request. Uh, get a new credit card machine. I got the greatest patients in the world, and I know y'all do too. Uh, patients will call in payments due to mail not running in most places. And I literally had people stop at my house, and I said, I have no idea what you owe me. And they said, well, I know what I owe you. I owe you $565. The other thing that you're going to see that is good, because this is when we stop thinking about going to Hattiesburg or going to Colorado, mm -hmm. is the Stafford Act is going to just flood your areas with cash. The plastic surgeons had their best year doing boob jobs when those people started getting cash. So, I mean, you, you know, you're going to think, and Tim and I thought, well, the only people we're going to see is people that are hurting. But, man, we had people who had been wanting to have six front crowns but didn't have the money. But th that cash came in, and, and we did a lot of <coughs> cosmetic work. I mean, they, we had a good year once we, and we were in trailers. But well, we had a good year once we got uh, up and running. Uh, fax and copy machine is a must. You know, if, if you've lost your, how many people in here have completely lost their office? Yeah. I mean, we sat up in a back room of my house and my office manager conducted business just like normal, except we didn't have any chairs to put patients in. The other thing that we did, and I don't have it here, so I'll, is we ordered some emergency equipment, got a tackle box like in dental school, and I had patients that, um, you know, they wanted to get the crown re in it, and I was like, why don't you maybe go over here where they're open, but they didn't want to do that. So I cemented crowns in my living room. I cemented crowns. Uh, I had a first grade teacher who let me in the side door and she made all her kids put their head on the desk so I could re-cement her, her front crown. Um, but, but people are gonna start looking for you. They really are. You're, you're, you know, it was all gloom and doom. And at this time, we were really bad. I mean, this, at these many, how many days has it been now? Is Monday will be three weeks? At, at this time, we were, I mean, we were like wanting to, wanting to leave. Um, Inform your, um, oh, no, no, the fax copy machine. If your building is completely destroyed, have the security system, electric gas, and water billing put on hold or discontinued. That way you will not be considered a new customer and will not have to pay a deposit again. 
inform your vendors of your new shipping address. We used one of the doctor's home addresses, which was mine. Uh, this way you'll be sure to get packages until you have a permanent location. Replace all your forms, appointment cards, letterheads, envelopes, checks. This will take time, so start planning now. Um, set up as quickly as possible. Very important to stay in, in um, contact with your patients. Uh, very important to stay in touch with your employers. And my employees understood completely. And when I said, I, I can't pay you when I'm not doing anything, and they understood, I went on unemployment. Uh, I, I didn't do it for very long because we were able to get up and running, but, um, and I used food stamps for the first time in my life. Um, if you find that you need a permit or a license for anything, most states and local governments will waive these fees if you're in the storm area. Call your insurance company and get your claim filed <coughs> as soon as possible, but don't expect your payment that way. If you lost your policy, request a copy SAP. You will need to verify everything they tell you. Most insurance companies will give you an advancement if you ask. So if they know, and we were fortunate that we did have some flood insurance, and they were, of course, they're the ones who also had our wind. So they figured if we took some flood, that that would eliminate us getting any wind or any business interruption. Um, If you pay your insurance premiums yearly, and that's what we did, well, you're not, you don't need anything to be insured anymore. So ask for a refund on all that. Lab cases, this was terrible. Um, I wrote a check to my lab for 10,000 and something dollars on September the 3rd, and all of those cases were gone. So it meant not only that I not had the cases, I had to pay the bill, I had to reappoint the patient, do the crown over, pay the lab again. So it was, it was horrendous that first six months trying to get all that crown and bridge into people's mouths. But I, I can't think of a single complaint that I had over somebody saying, why didn't you take that out of there? Well, you know, there were a lot of things. We had just We'd had digital since 1999. We had Schick, and we had just renovated our office <coughs> and had bought two more sensors and had never taken them out of the box. And I know y'all have similar stories like that. It's just incredible what, if you knew, was going to happen. Um, get a list of everything that was lost, not just the big items, everything. The small things add up quickly when you have to resupply. Ask your insurance company, they have forms that will help you. Best thing to do is have a person who works in a certain area to sit and imagine everything around his or her work area and write it down. Everything includes pictures on the walls down to every item in the desk drawers. Ask your vendors for past history you can get replacement costs from these invoices as well as how much you'll need to order. You need to keep any and all copies of equipment invoices to give your accountant for tax purposes. Keep in mind 2012 is almost over, so any tax breaks for this year need to be addressed. Employee concern. Compile a list of phone numbers to stay in contact with employees. Include multiple numbers, husband, wife, because some cell, phone, so, some cell phone towers are down. Uh, your staff can file unemployment during your time down, downtime if you're not paying them their full salary. Also, that goes for you too, so you can get unemployment. Try to keep staff updated on your plans and encourage them to do the same. Um, some banks will offer bridge loans. Ours was offering a $25,000 bridge loan. When applying for any grant or loan, you will need the list of everything that you lost. Check with banks about special interest rates on equipment. Oh, my brother and I used different labs. His lab didn't charge him at all for um, redos. So I thought that was real nice. Um, when applying for any grant or loan, you will need the list of everything that you lost. 
check with banks about special interest rates on equipment loans. If you lost your bank history, request it. If you want it, you may need it for accounting purposes. SBA loans are great interest loans, but be cautious because they're gonna put a lien on everything that you got. And that happened to us. We did an SBA loan and when we tried to move back into our uh, office, we wanted to consolidate my two properties. We had to get their permission to consolidate the, make it one address. So we were, we were real glad to pay, uh, and I don't mean this, I know the SBA person's probably here, it's just we were real glad to get that off of our books. Um, when applying for an SBA loan, they will ask you for any and all invoices, so keep all invoices, equipment, and supplies when you start to order. Call your carrier, UPS, Federal Express. You may have deliveries they're holding or have already sent back. Uh, and some of y'all may have even done this. We had so many donations from people, uh, I mean, other dentists. I mean, we, we got a, uh, an autoclave, a big autoclave that they, they gave like 200 of them out and they were just sitting in there. They said, go grab you one. And, uh, I mean, composite. I mean, I, I never had as much composite because this composite was, I don't know what they were doing, but we just had boxes and boxes of it that they gave us. And um, hand instruments and hand pieces. We got a couple of slow speed hand pieces. I mean, you know, it was serious good. Um, Stay connected with your colleagues. Networking is important. It will keep you informed of any updates and resources. You know, back then we probably weren't doing what we're doing now. You know, I know we weren't text messaging and doing that, but uh, like I said, the, the specialists lent us. In fact, when we went to put our building on these two lot, on this one lot, I told him it didn't fit. And he said, don't worry, he owned the other lot too. So that's where we were. Um, I know I'm kind of getting long-winded, and if y'all want me to quit, I will. Uh, the, the ADA and our local dental association waived dues for us that year. And my daughter, having written that uh, letter, got tuition free for two semesters. So if you have kids in college, you, you may look at something like that. Okay. Thanks, Doc. Um, just one, uh, one question. You brought up two items, the zero in Congress. Any connection there? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, next up is Brother Tim, Dr. Tim McCabe. He's covered it all. He's covered it all? <laughs> He's got it all. Okay, good. All right. All right, then uh, I just want to leave him up here for support. <laughs> okay. Uh, next but not least is Joe Calabrese, the Territorial Manager for uh, Butler Shine Animal Health. Joe. Well, I'm definitely humbled just to uh, sit here next to uh, all these uh, doctors, and uh, he's got a lot of abbreviations next to his name. So um, it's definitely uh, a privilege and honor to be here. It's a privilege and honor to work for a company like Henry Shine and um, really see all that it does in putting an event like this together. Uh, Henry Shine Cares, and I think this is uh, a tremendous resource. Um, so I, I'm a territory manager for the Long Island, Brooklyn, and Queens area, which basically means I'm the uh, sales guy for, uh, for Henry Shine for all the, on the vet side. And uh, during the hurricane, or the event, as we learn to say, right? During the uh, events, the, you know, I thought to myself, you know, after all these doctors just experienced this, the last person they want to see is a salesperson. <laughs> you know, walk into their door trying to sell them something. But, um, you know, really I felt uh, a need to, to go out and just to really see how the doctors were doing, how the practice was doing, you know, what is it that you need? I didn't bring a, I didn't bring a sales fly, I didn't bring a, a, a computer in an office or anything like that. I just walked in and said, how are you guys doing? Um, how can I help? What do you need? What are the questions? You know, what are you experiencing? Um, one of the things that, um, Typically, November and December sometimes does get a little slow uh, during this time already. So a lot of practices were without power for uh, 
up to 10 days, anywhere from a minimum of four or five days to 10 days. Um, some practices, which we have represented here, I know uh, basically lost their hospital. Uh, some buildings have been condemned, some solely rebuilding, but obviously, as we heard, there's a lot of uh, process that has to take place for that to happen. Um, a lot of effects that, uh, that I'm seeing out there in the field as well was, you know, people that uh, maybe they didn't lose their building, they got their power back, but, you know, they're sitting around, there's nothing to do. Uh, they're, calling their, they're telling their staff don't come into work because their clients don't have gas to get to, uh, to, get to the veterinarian to take care of their, their animals. Um, a lot of people are canceling, you know, their appointments. Um, staff, professionals had to lay off staff, um, doctors worried about their business. And then, you know, you have your business and then actually, obviously just as we heard, uh, Dr. McCabe share, you know, uh, their own homes. I had one doctor that I talked to, basically, um, he's in the Rockaways, Animal House for Rockaways, his partner, Dr. Simon is here as well. And I think it was about um, the second week right after the hurricane, uh, or the event rather, I knew that I, want, I couldn't get in touch with them. I knew, obviously, there was a lot of devastation down there. So uh, I kind of ventured out down to the Rockways. Matter of fact, my manager was like, don't go down, don't go down there. And um, my uh, friend of mine who works, uh, well, friend, uh, my uncle who's a, who's a cop, had said there was a lot of different things going on, you know, safety and stuff. But uh, I really felt just to go down there just to see what was going on, see what, um, you know, they needed. And as I walked through the hospital, I could just see, I mean, things just in shambles, um, equipment destroyed, uh, tiles ripped up, sheetrock just destroyed. And as I kind of worked my way to the back, the, the two doctors were just in, the, uh, in their cars uh, with what supplies they were able to grab and things like that. And uh, one of the doctors said, um, fortunately, two of the doctors don't live in the area that was affected. One of the doctors did live in the area that was affected. and has flood insurance. However, the flood insurance, and I don't know if anybody's heard or, or experienced this, the flood insurance that he has does not cover a basement flood. So um, that was his call. So it's like, I, I don't know how uh, some of these insurance companies really are able to, to write some of these policies, but uh, I think um, some of the things uh, the doctors here said are really, really important, and things that kind of an eye opener and an ear opener for us to see you know, moving forward to really look at cert some of these things. I was actually going to ask you guys, that list that you have there would be really useful maybe to email out. Um, we brought 50 of them. You did? Okay, that's great. Um, yeah, so these are great resources, and I know just as a, um, you know, as a salesperson, you know, our, our goal, uh, you know, is not just to sell product, but really to provide that service. That's really what Henry Shine's about. That's really what we stand for, and uh, just partnering with the practitioners. So um, I know me personally and a lot of my colleagues, our job is just going to be to collect this data, collect these services, and be able to provide a lot of these things for uh, all of you there that are, uh, you know, clinicians out there. So thank you, and it's a privilege to be here.